Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to start looking for this really cool book called History of the World, Map by Map. And this book was very kindly donated to my channel by S. Heffley. Thank you so much, Heffley, for donating this book from my Amazon wishlist. If you want to check it out right now, it's right down there in the description box. I'm really excited for this book, mainly because when I lived in California, my library had this book in their system, and I was like, oh, that's good to know. I can check it out whenever I want because I love it. And now that I live in Nevada, my library system does not have this book. So I'm very excited to own it forever. This is a book that's going to stay with me for the rest of my life because I love it so much. But I haven't really had a chance to read over this section that we're going to look over tonight because I've spent the last week coughing my lungs out with COVID. So I have a cough drop in right now. I'll try not to make too much noise with it. I know some people are into that sound. I'm kind of sort of not. There's very few creators that I'm into that cough drop sound, so I'll keep it down. So don't worry. I'll keep it at a minimum. But um, I've been sick and I'm dying to look through this book, so I thought, you know what? Let me just do it with my viewers. We'll do it together. So we're going to start off in the first chapter here. Let me show you what it's called. It is, whoop, slide it over, <laughs> prehistory. So we're just going to look at the maps. We're not going to do any reading. One, because there is a lot of reading in these books. <laughs> and, um, we'll get to it on another day. Today I just want to look at the cool maps inside. So let's look at the first one here about the first humans. So as you can see, we're in all throughout lots of Africa. Got pretty much everything but West Africa, right? Central, North, East, and South. But we're going to start off with this box, number one. First, human-like apes, 7 to 5.5 million years ago. The sparse record of the earliest hominins, Sahelanthropus and Aurorin, shows that although they had shorter faces and smaller teeth, they had brains no larger than those of chimpanzees. The sole Sahelanthropus Sahel skull was discovered in Chad, far removed from other hominin sites in eastern and southern Africa. Fossils of both Aurorin and Ardipithecus Kadaba are thought to exhibit features linked to developing two-legged locomotion. So where we have a red triangle, that's Sahelanthropus. Upside down is Aurorin, and a square is Ardipithecus. So let's find them on the map. We have a discovery here of the Aurorin, which I've never heard of. It's so interesting. There's the Sahelanthropus up here in what's today Chad. And in within the Sahel, hence the name Sahelanthropus. And then over here in Ethiopia, we have the Ardipithecus, the very first kind of human-like apes, like it's in the box, the first hominins. And then there's the Sahelanthropus skull. Pretty cool find. Let's see the second box. It says human-like apes diversify. 5.3 to 2.58 million years ago. I'm kind of far away. Let me go like this so I can see it a little easier. Maybe you can too. Fossils from this time indicate diversity of hominin species. Fossils of Ardipithecus romidus, romidus, romidus found in Ethiopia include the oldest near complete hominin skeleton. Later, Kenyanthropus, known from a single skull, and early Paranthropus, with its enormous molars, lived alongside several species of the genus Australopithecus, one of which left the famous Latofi footprints 3.7 to 3 million years ago, showing that his striding gait had evolved. Look at this footprint from 3 million years ago. 
So orange square is Ardipithecus. Orange diamond is Kenyathropus. The pentagon here, orange pentagon, is Australopithecus. And the circle is Paranthropus. Let's find them on the map. So I see right away there's the Australopithecus up here. Here in Ethiopia, like it said, we have Ardipithecus and the Australopithecus. Same down here, we have a circle for Paranthropus. And here near Lake Turkana, there's the diamond. And for Kenyanthropus, obviously in Kenya, right? Right here. And then there was one found way down here. So they really spread out, didn't they? Let's read the next box. Our own genus appears 2.58 million years ago to 300,000 years ago. Homo habilis, the first member of our genus in the fossil record, evolved and for a time lived alongside later Australopithecus and Paranthropus species. Stone tools from this period have been found, but it is difficult to assign them to a species. Homo ergaster was the first hominin to have human-like body proportions. It likely gave rise to Homo heidelbergensis, from which modern humans evolved. So let's see what we have here. The pentagon here is for Australopithecus. The octagon is for Paranthropus. The half crescent here is for Homo habilis, which here's the hand axe here. Oh, that hand axe is probably from Homo ergaster, which is this shape. And then Homo heidelbergensis is this one, which I didn't know they found those in Africa. I thought those were just kind of later Neanderthal kind of things up in Europe. So let's see. Oh, and look where they were. Up here in what's now Morocco. If that makes sense why they were discovered in Europe, right? They also found them in Africa. We can see a bunch here in the Horn of Africa. We have Australopithecus. Homo habilis, Homo ergaster, and Homo heidelbergensis. Down here too in the Ethiopian highlands. We found an ergaster here near Lake Turkana. And a bunch over here as well. In Olduvai Gorge, very famously. We'll talk about that in a minute. Right down here as well, there's a Homo heidelbergensis as well. And then a bunch down here in southern Africa. Very interesting. And then let's read the last box here. Homo sapiens prevails 300,000 to 50,000 years ago. When the first Homo sapiens became established, all other known African hominins died out, except one. Us. We did it. Fossil remains recently dated to 335,000 to 236,000 years ago suggest that a species named Homo naledi was inhabiting southern Africa at about the time Homo sapiens first appeared. Whether the species interacted is unknown, but with Homo naledi's disappearance, our species would have had Africa to itself. A very human of us, right? So the Homo naledi is the half circle. Homo sapiens is a full circle. So, down here in South Africa, there's lots of very ancient Homo sapiens found. And then here at the Rising Star Cave, we have Homo naledi. Not to mention a bunch of ancient Homo sapiens found all through here in the Great Rift Valley, up in the Horn of Africa. Right here, right here, up here, and a bunch up here. Let's read all these little extra things on here. First, this is the very famous Turkana boy. There's his skull right there. The skull of a young ma male Homo ergaster was found along with his well-preserved, nearly complete skeleton near Lake Turkana, Kenya. Because his brain was about 60% the size of a modern human's, his skull narrows immediately behind the eye sockets. Interesting. Up here, it looks like Chepel learned today. 300,000 years ago, 
the earliest remains of Homo sapiens in the fossil record were unearthed here in Morocco. Wow, that's so neat. Let's see up here, circa 200,000 years ago. Excavations of this cave near the Libyan coast have produced evidence of cont continual occupation by modern humans for many thousands of years. Wow. Over here, 3.6 to 3 million years ago, the discovery of Australopithecus, um, what does that say? Um, Byregazali, by, by Byregazali, Fossils in Chad extended the known range of Australopithecus species. Wow, it's so weird to me that there were so many different types of humans. Like, can you imagine that today? Like, straight up different species of humans. Like, it's so bizarre to me. It's, I guess it's more bizarre that there's only one surviving species. Like, how many animals have just one species, you know? But... And I think it's neat. It says 5.8 million years ago, right here in Middle Awash, the history of hominin occupation in the Middle Awash site in Ethiopia's Afar Depression uh, stretches back to the time of Ardipithecus Kadaba. Lots of famous ancient human sites here. And ancient hominin sites, I should say. 4.2 million years ago, Numerous species of Paranthropus and early human ancestors were first discovered in the Omo Turkana Basin. 3.3 million years ago, the oldest stone tools ever discovered from the archaeological site of Lomekwi predate the appearance of the Homo genus. Wow. Over here, circa 1.8 to 1.6 million years ago, one of our earliest ancestors, Homo habilis, lived here alongside Paranthropus boise, Paranthropus boise, for thousands of years. Up here, just below Lake Victoria, circa 350,000 years ago. Found in 1973, the Indutu cranium has features common to both Homo erectus and archaic Homo sapiens and has been assigned to Homo heidelbergensis. Let's see what's happening down here in the south. If I can get it on the shot, yeah. 300,000 to 125,000 years ago, this very robust Homo heidelbergensis cranium found in Kabwe, Zambia in 1921 once held a brain approaching the size of modern humans. Down here in the Rising Star Cave, very famous spot, 335,000 to 236,000 years ago. The Cradle of Humankind site contains the Rising Star Cave system, where fossils of Homo, sorry, Homo naledi were first discovered in 2013. And right over here, 294,000 to 224,000 years ago. A partial cranium found at Flores Bad, South Africa, appears to be that of a transitional individual with features common in both Homo heidelbergensis and Homo sapiens. Maybe it was like a cross between them. Very interesting. Here we go. Out of Africa. Let's look at maps of human mind if I can fit this in. Hmm, how am I gonna get this in? I'm just gonna have to do a crooked, I'm sorry. <laughs> there we go. Part one, Homo sapiens in Africa, 300,000 to 70,000 years ago. Before Homo sapiens first left Africa, they flourished as a species and began to exhibit what we might recognize as modern behavior. Excavations at the Blombus Caves on the southern tip of Africa have produced some of the earliest evidence of complex thought and innovation, including jewelry, engraved stones, refined bone tools, projectile weapons, and painting materials. 
So the purple skulls here are fossil sites and the diamonds are archaeological sites. So places they didn't find fossils, right? So you can see that there in the Blombus Caves. And we have fossils all here. And kind of like we talked about before, all throughout this part of Africa and then up here. Let's see, number two, the early Asian expansions. 194,000 to 88,000 years ago. The earliest evidence of modern humans living outside Africa are a partial jaw and teeth from Mycelia Cave in Israel, dated to 194,000 to 177,000 years ago. Fossils from Skul and Kapsa, also in Israel, dated to around 120,000 years ago, probably represent a subsequent wave of expansion. The discovery of an 88,000-year-old finger bone in al Wusta, Saudi Arabia, has extended the range of early migrations to the Arabian Peninsula. So we can follow their migration here. And the skulls are the fossil sites. So they've migrated up to here. What's today Israel? And up into here, into what's now Saudi Arabia. Let's see number three. My cough drop's about to chew up. Hold on. Okay, there we go. Number three, Eastern Coastal Route, 80,000 to 40,000 years ago. The genetic trail of modern humans leaving Africa leads through the Middle East, then along the coast of South Asia. People living off rich coastal resources may have made swift progress. Fossil evidence proves that they reached Borneo by 40,000 years ago, while Australian sites have been dated to 65,000 years ago. Wow. So let's follow their migration routes in the red. Let's see. There's a bunch. So let me try to get them all in here. There we go. <laughs> I can't fit them all in here. There we go. Okay. So we travel across northern Africa. And up here from the Great Rift Valley, across the Middle East here, and up through the Arabian Peninsula, down here into India, where we see some fossils down here in Sri Lanka, some sites in India, also up here too. And they travel around the Indian subcontinent and then down through the Malay Peninsula to the archipelago here. All throughout the islands and eventually down into Australia. Pretty cool. Lots of fossil sites, or archaeological sites, I should say. Pretty neat. Alright, let's see the next part. Europe colonized 50,000 to 25,000 years ago. Despite its relative proximity to Africa, modern humans did not start to colonize Europe until around 50,000 years ago. Early sites suggest that they spread along coastlines and rivers, starting in the eastern Mediterranean. Although little fossil evidence exists, the rich archaeological material includes the first figurative carvings and musical instruments. Let's see this migration. So it looks like as they traveled this way, some went up north, over to here. And as they traveled up this way, some went across Asia Minor and into Europe. We see some fossils here and lots of archaeological sites and fossils there. We'll read all the little captions after. Number five, interaction with Neanderthals, 50,000 to 28,000 years ago. Neanderthals had been living in Europe for hundreds of thousands of years before modern humans arrived. Although the timing and locations are unknown, ancient genetics suggests thousands of interbreeding events. Some fossils attributed to modern humans show features associated with Neanderthals, leading some scientists to speculate that these individuals may be hybrids. So we can see here in Europe, and Central Asia. Lots of fossil sites from this era from the Neanderthal times. Lots of archaeological 
sights as well which I wonder how like okay I'm gonna speculate a little because I've always wondered like you know they talk about which you're gonna talk about in this next book interbreeding between homo sapiens and neanderthals like did we just find neanderthals like super fine like or we like wow i gotta get a piece of that like how exactly i don't want to know actually let's move on the mysterious denisovans 150,000 to 50,000 years ago dna analysis of a finger bone and two teeth from denisovic cave in siberia has identified a previously unknown and distinct population the denisovans although their remains have only been found at one site their genes indicate that they were widespread contemporaries of the neanderthals they also interbred with this species as well as homo sapiens like where the Denisovans just like wow super attractive I don't know but there's the fossil site there at Denisova cave what book was it my um Lost Cities Ancient Tombs book I think which I really need to get back into because some of you guys really loved that book that apparently this guy named Dennis just like decided to leave society and squatted in this cave so they called it Denisova cave or Dennis's cave and now <laughs> Will remember Dennis forever because they named the cave or they named the people after the cave so <laughs> thank you Dennis for your lasting contribution to human history oh there's one more box hold on right down here central to East Asia 120,000 to 45,000 years ago populations that spread to central and eastern asia probably came from those that had originally colonized coastal southern asia the cold bleak environments they encountered to the north would have demanded great adaptability those that reached the far northeast would give rise to the populations that went on to colonize the americas so as they were traveling toward the indian subcontinent some went this way here and some they're traveling this way went up this way all the way up to here and look at that there's even a sign up there and lots of fossil evidence around here and even here on this it looks like a Japanese island very cool okay let's read all the little things because I want to know more here it says the emergence of art the Venus of um Prasimpui in France, dating to about 25,000 years ago, features one of the earliest known representations of the human face. And you know, this thing is like this big too, like they always are <laughs> from these times. So here it says 40,000 years ago, around 70 stone axes were found buried in dated volcanic sediment layers here. Wow. Up here, I want to know this story, but we're going to read about this one. 120,000 to 80,000 years ago, human remains at Tianyuan Cave are the oldest in East Asia. Wow. Let's see what happened. Who wound up way up here in Siberia? And during like, oof, it's even colder then than it is now. 45,000 years ago. Tools along with mammoth and rhinoceros bones show humans living above the Arctic Circle during the Ice Age. I guess it makes sense they were following the mammoths right and eventually they would go this way i think that's what the next map is let's see what's happening over here Twenty-four thousand years ago according to dna analysis malta boy shares a close ancestry with the male found in kostenki europe wow and then this is kostenki right here 30 38,700 to 36,200 years ago. A male from Kostenki is one of the oldest modern humans found in Europe. I'm probably reading it backwards. I'm supposed to be reading it this way, but too late now. <laughs> Let's see over here. 42,000 to 37,000 years ago. DNA extracted from remains of Homo sapiens from Pestera, Kuwase, Romania. <laughs> Sorry, Romanians. I probably butchered that. Is estimated to be 5 to 11% Neanderthal, 
meaning that it had a Neanderthal relation within four to six generations. Let's see what's happening over here in Africa. I gotta tilt it sideways for you guys. Oh, and then we'll read about Sri Lanka. 300,000 years ago, Jebel Erhud is the site of the earliest Homo sapiens yet found, which we read about on the other page. A kind of proto-Homo sapien with a modern, flat face from a primitive rear skull. And then way down here, 35,000 years ago, Border Cave yielded the Labombo bone to archaeologists. This bears marks suggesting a counting tally similar to those used in recent times by the San people of the Kalahari. I wonder if that means like a bone that they carved into to keep track of things. That's pretty neat. Then here in Sri Lanka, 38,000 to 30,000 years ago, Palin got a man in Sri Lanka represents the earliest reliably dated record of anatomically modern humans in South Asia. Let's see the next map. Isn't this fun? <laughs> I'm having a great time. Oh dear, it's sideways. Well, this actually might be easier with my camera angle. Peopling the Americas. There we go. Alright, number one. Asian origins. I'm like reaching across my desk to do this. This was before 25,000 years ago. Probably before 40,000 years ago. Hunter-gatherers were already living in Asian Arctic regions. These hardy people who hunted mammoth at the Yama RHS site in Siberia were used to harsh conditions and well prepared to take advantage of the lower sea levels that exposed the Beringia landmass joining Asia and America before 24,000 years ago. They were the ancestors of the first people who crossed to America. Number two, Founder Americans. This is 26,000 to 13,000 years ago. Genetic evidence indicates that most early North Americans arose from one of two branches of a population originating in East Asia. These common ancestors of ancient Beringians and today's Native Americans' as ancestors were blocked by ice sheets before moving past Alaska. The first Americans went farther south and into Canada when receding ice sheets exposed coastal and interior routes. So here we can see some archaeological sites from that time up here, like Alaska, northern Canada, Yukon area. And then they traversed here down the coast as the ice receded. And it became easier to do so. And right down through here, you can tell that the ice was melting. This area, right? This is mountains. This is ice sheets. So they cut through right there. And there's even a site from this time right there. Looks like that's about, oh yeah, it's past Lake Michigan. So that's in like what, Montana? Somewhere around there. What does it say? We'll read it later. <laughs> Number three North American cultures, 15,000 to 10,000 years. Multiple population dispersals pushed on through North America, but archaeological evidence is dominated by stone artifacts left by peoples of the so-called Clovis culture around 13,000 years ago. Named after an archaeological site in New Mexico, the Clovis people were mobile hunter-gatherers who used tools to kill and butcher large animals such as mammoths. We can see them heading down into what's now the United States and lots of Clovis sites. Um, I know famously the Clovis points, which are pretty much arrowheads, right? Oh, these things, <laughs> Clovis points, have been found all throughout this region of America. Up here, too. You know, this is a personal story, but where I grew up in California, our house was like brand new, like it had been built um, right before I was born and my parents were the first to buy it. 
and we would dig around our yard before we put in grass or anything it was just dirt and we would find arrowheads all the time so like i'm sure it was just like the local peoples who lived there and you know the 1700s 1800s but like a part of me is like what if they were globus points what if we were living on top of like an ancient archaeological site but no they didn't look anything like this i should say they were um much well i don't know if these are actual size but they were like about this big and black but anyway isn't that interesting that we would just dig around and just find arrowheads and be like oh here's another one oh america right <laughs> here's the fourth box penetrating farther south fourteen thousand to twelve thousand years ago at least one bloodline diverged from the rest of the north americans and migrated southward these people took their hunting technology with them as they reached out into the more tropical regions of Central America, then down toward the equator and South America. So we can see them moving down Central America here to the Isthmus, right? There's a site right there that we'll read about. I wonder why. Maybe just more land, you know, or Maybe they wanted to check out Central America. Who wouldn't, right? It's a beautiful place. Next, we're colonizing South America 14,000 to 10,000 years ago. Most of South America's earliest colonists stuck to the Pacific coast, where they spread in the Andean region before continuing down toward Patagonia. It is likely that they crossed the Andes with some people living at altitudes of over 13,120 feet to go eastward deep into the Amazon basin or across Patagonia. Why were they climbing the Andes? That sounds so perilous. <laughs> but here they went down the coast. I guess they were just kind of following the ocean and exploring the mountains all the way down as far as they could go. Oh, there's the ones that crossed the Andes up into Patagonia. And then some that followed this coast up through the jungle and the Amazon. Let's see what's next. Oh, up north again. The origins of Arctic indigenous peoples about 5,000 years ago. Within the last 5,000 years, the ancestors of today's Inuit, Inupiat, and Yupik peoples entered America. Like the earlier colonists, they probably arrived from northeastern Asia but stayed in the north. The complex skills that allowed them to live and hunt in the Arctic are still practiced today. So look at this. I have to like lean far back to get into shot. Traveling across northern Canada and then way up into all the islands here up in the Arctic Circle. And then down into Hudson Bay. Very exciting. Let's read all the little captions here. We're here. 13,000 years ago. Blades and flake tools, but without burns, which are just like edges, at Ushki Complex, right there. Moving on, we've got 13,000 years ago, tools similar to those of the Ushki Complex. And, looks like up here, 14,000 years ago, microblades, similar to those used in central Siberia. More evidence that they came from up here over here is 11,500 years ago. This double child burial, one of which Zachitian Tidge, oh goodness, I butchered that, my apologies, or the sunrise girl child, provided DNA evidence of ancient Beringian people. And right here, 24,000 years ago, mammoth bone and flakes indicate possible eastern reach of Iyana culture from Siberia. Let's see, this site is from 12,600 years ago. Clovis-type infant, or Anzic one, this first ancient Native American DNA sample providing a full genetic sequence. Well, let's see, these are a little older. 14,000 to 13,600 years ago up here. Dates of wooden tools match local First Nations or the 
Litsuk Nation's oral history of its colonization. At this point, 13,800 years ago, the pre-Clovis stone tool embedded in bone. Wow, someone got murked. <laughs> and then up here at Paisley Cave, 14,000 years ago, are human coprolites, which are, you know, what's number twos. <laughs> And then up, or I should say down here, 13,000 years ago, human remains um, offshore islands indicate possible use of watercraft. How cool. Let's move to Central North America here. 20,000 to 19,000 years ago, butchering marks on mammoth bones are possible evidence for one of the earliest southward movements of humans from ice locked then here's Clovis, 13,000 years ago. Clovis, for many years, thought to be the oldest anthropological deposit in North America. And then up here, 16,000 to 14,000 years ago, one of the oldest sites with non-Clovis tools and a range of plants gathered for food, including seeds, fruit, and corn. Right here, 15,000 years ago, the oldest Clovis artifacts possibly used for working wood and bone. At this place, 14,600 years ago, there's evidence of butchering of mastodons. That's pretty neat. Right here, 16,000 years ago, 650,000 artifacts. Wow, mainly blades and flakes could indicate permanent quarrying size. Let's move down into Mexico here. 13,000 years ago. Evidence of transition from hunter-gatherer to early farming settlements. Wow, that's neat. And in South America, 13,000 years ago, evidence of stone spearheads and butchered mastodon. I didn't know mastodons lived so far south. 11,500 years ago, the oldest human skeleton, Lucy. Lucia is found in Brazil. I see the oldest Brazilian human skeleton. Gotcha. 13,100 years ago, right here, the human, there was human habitation with living floor, hearth, and horses. Nice. 18,500 to 14,500 years ago, the oldest human habitation in South America. Possibly a coastal culture, unusually good preservation, including hearths, hide, and plants. 11,000 years ago, there's spearhead, human fossil, and remains of hunted animals. Then way down here, 10,500 years ago, stone scrapers, choppers, and bolas probably used to hunt birds. So amazing how, how like, ingenious these people are. Here's the Clovis spearheads, the Clovis points. It says, by facially worked, which means chipped into shape on each side. Uh, flint points were characteristic products of Clovis technology across North America. Yeah, part of me is always going to wonder, like, what if those were Clovis points we found in our yard? But I know they weren't. Alright, let's learn about the origins of agriculture. And I think this is the last... Oh no, there's one more map after this. I'm not done. I want to see more. This book is the coolest. And these maps go up to 2018. So, and we're, gosh, we're 3000 BCE. So we've got a lot of maps to read on this channel. I'm so excited. Number one, domestication of crops in Asia, China, 11,000 to 3,000. Rice became the staple cereal grain crop in river valleys in China. Farmers chose the best glutinous rice grains to grow more plants, so rice grains got bigger. This human-driven change had already transformed wild wheat in Mesopotamia, where harvesting bicycles had by chance favored non-shattering seed heads. But selection of rice grains in Asia probably happened through more conscious effort. The first GMOs, right? 
So let's see, we've got archaeological sites, we've got militant rice, the paler one is just rice, soybeans, the lighter ones are mung beans, we've got melons, pigs, horses, chickens, and ducks, and the lighter ones are cattle. So you can see pretty much all those are right here and over here. And lots of archaeological sites. Pretty cool. Number two is down here. Do, 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 do. Okay, I think I've got it. Agriculture in the wet tropics of New Guinea, 10,000 to 4,000 BCE. Covered with rainforest, the tropical island of New Guinea offered a completely different mix of food plants. Instead of cereal grains, people grew fruit and root crops, notably banana and taro, the latter of which has both edible roots and leaves and is still a local food staple. But farming here was only part of the local economy. The region remains today the only primary center of agriculture that has not contributed domesticated species to the rest of the world. How interesting, so up here in New Guinea, you can see there's archaeological sites, bananas, taros, and yams, but no agriculture. Isn't that interesting? Let me grab a drink of water real quick. Hold on one second. Let me... Okay, my water bottle's full, so you can't hear it. <laughs> this is the most that I've talked in a week. <laughs> I've been coughing my lungs out with COVID, so I'm, I'm excited. Number three, earliest evidence of agriculture, the classic Mesopotamia, 12,000 to 4,000 BCE. It is no coincidence that some of the earliest crops were grown on the nutrient-rich floodplain between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers of modern-day Iraq. Here in Mesopotamia, which means between rivers, wheat was domesticated around 11,000 BCE. This region was part of a so-called Fertile Crescent that stretched westward as far as the Levant and became key to the Global Agricultural Revolution. Can you see the box? There we go. <laughs> My bad. That, that's the size I can get it, so I think I've got it all. So we've got archaeological sites, and there are many. Wheat and barley, lentil, peas and chickpeas, olives, and sheep goats, pigs, and cattle, and of course all throughout. You can actually see the crescent here, the fertile crescent. And there they all are right here in Mesopotamia. Looks like there are some other um, agriculture or archaeological sites from Mesopotamia up here in like Greece and Egypt. Pretty cool. Next is, there we go, livestock before crops, Africa. 9,000 to 2,000 BCE. In some parts of the world, animals were domesticated before crops. In Africa, cattle were being used as early as 9,000 BCE, but local cereal grains such as millet and sorghum were not domesticated until thousands of years after that. Agriculture began in the Sahara. Due to increased rainfall after the Ice Age, the area was then covered by grasslands, lakes, and marshes. As the region dried, agriculture spread southward. So, it looks like this is brown, right? <laughs> Archaeological sites, we've got sorghum and millet, oil palm and date palm, cattle, donkeys, and camels. You can see. There's the archaeological sites from this time. There's the cattle, and then some farming up here in the Sahel and Upper Nile Valley. Remember, the Nile River flows this way, so this is the upper, this is the lower. Very important to remember in ancient history. <laughs> lower Egypt means along the Mediterranean. And number five, different kinds of crops and livestock in America. 10,000 to 2,000 BCE. Across the Old World, similar kinds of crops and livestock were being used in separate centers of agriculture. 
but the early colonizers of the Americas found entirely new plants such as squashes and corn. The variety of these plants increased as people from different regions exchanged their produce. The only large animals suitable for domestication in the Americas, llamas and alpacas, were both found in the Andes. So we can see the archaeological sites are diamonds, a corn and millet, peanuts, squash and sunflowers, the lighter apples here are squash and avocados, potatoes, turkeys, the lighter ones are llamas and alpacas. Of course you can see them. The archaeological sites throughout and then lots of farming sites here, down in here, right here, and right here. Lots of fertile little areas there. Let's read all the little captions now. Let's start in the North America. Why not? Let's start off with this cool statue. He's got his legs up. The Hungarian statuette, it says. There we go. Agriculture's significance to community life was frequently expressed in art, such as the fifth millennium sickle class being idle from Central Europe. Yeah, he's got it slung over his shoulder. That's a neat statue, I like. Let's see over here. Let's go backwards in time. 2000 BCE. Corn cultivation spreads from Mesoamerica to North America. And in 9000 BCE, with the rapid domestication of corn, it's kind of like going backwards. Corn's here and then spread around. But 5000 BCE, there's evidence of squash domestication. I love squash. 2000 BCE, right here, the earliest domestication of turkeys by the Mayans. Good for them, those are very aggressive birds. 6,000 BCE, the earliest domestication of llamas by the Incas. Pretty cool. What does this dot mean? I didn't. It I must talk about it on another thing. Oh no. Secondary centers of agriculture. Okay. It's something that we'll look at on another day because there's just too much to look at in this book. Right here, 7,000 BCE, is the arrival of agriculture in Europe with food producing economy adopted in Greece. Right here in 5,000 BCE is the earliest known domestication of cattle in Africa. And over here in 3,100 BCE, the first major irrigation project under Egypt's first dynasty diverts flood water of the Nile. Up here, 3,500 to 3,000 BCE, archaeological evidence of sorghum domestication. 5,000 BCE, likely origin of domestication of oil palm. Up here in 4,500 BCE is evidence of pearl millet domestication, the earliest known cultivated crop in Africa. And down here, one million years ago, Evidence of first controlled use of fire by humans at Wonderwerk Cave. Possibly earliest barbecue. Whoa, that's awesome. That's something you don't ever think about. <laughs> Let's head over to Mesopotamia here. 11,000 BCE, earliest evidence of plant domestication in the form of, what does that say? Ember? An iron core? don't know my types of wheats, so okay. 10,200 BCE, the earliest evidence of pig domestication. 10,000 BCE, the earliest evidence of sheep and goat domestication. 10,500 BCE, modern cattle domesticated from a small founding herd containing probably as few as 80. Over here in 5500 BCE, the earliest evidence of horse domestication, including use of harnesses. Let's head to the Indian subcontinent. Before 10,000 BCE, wild jungle fowl, ancestor of modern day chickens, are domesticated. So cool. And in 7000 BCE, as the possible early cultivation of rice in southern Asia. Over here, though, in 10,000 BCE, the 
archaeological evidence of millet, the earliest known dry farming crop in Asia. And up here is the origin of all domesticated Asian rice in 8000 BCE. Wow. And then lastly, down here, remember in New Guinea, 7000 BCE, archaeological evidence of banana and taro cultivation. So cool, right? This last map here is of Mesopotamia. There's the Angazel statues. I'm obsessed with them. They're so funny looking. It looks like, you know, when you're like three years old and you draw a person and it's just a head and legs. <laughs> That's what they look like. But with eerie faces. Alright, part one. Transition from nomads to settlements. 12,500 to 9,000 BCE. The Natufian people descended from nomads of the Levant and Sinai, made the earliest settlements in Southwest Asia from about 12,500 BCE. At first, these were probably nothing more than seasonal hunting camps, although evidence for these is scant because nomads had few material possessions. Makes sense. Their descendants stockpiled food that demanded permanent storage. Let's see the little rectangles here, spread of settlements, and the archaeological sites. Let's see if we can find where these are. Well, here's some archaeological sites right here. I don't see any yellow rectangles, do you? There's another site there in Cyprus. I'm sure we'll find them as we... Oh my gosh, you guys, I just coughed so hard. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. Moving on. <laughs> I'm gonna start losing my voice now, so I'm gonna start to get raspy. Maybe I should grab another cough drop. Yeah, let me grab another cough drop. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Like I said, I have not spoken this much <laughs> in over a week. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> I just got Next part. First agrarian settlements, 11,000 to 6,000 BCE. Farmers emerged from early settlers who exploited wild cereal grains such as rye, which was cultivated as early as 11,050 BCE. At first, settlers rallied together to protect wild food plants from grazing animals, but over time, plants were moved or seeds sown closer to home. Houses became more permanent as mud brick replaced perishable brushwood as building material. So the green rectangles are the spread of settlements and the dark green diamonds are archaeological sites from this time. I don't see... Oh! <laughs> They're not rectangles, it's just the color of the area. So the spread of them was this area here. This time period is this area here. Got it. <laughs> and then there's like a, a chart up here that shows it. So, and more of a graph. But I'm more visual. Anyways. That wasn't embarrassing. Moving on. Number three. Spread of material culture, 7,000 to 4,000 BCE. More food supported bigger settlements as villages proliferated over a wider region from Anatolia in the west to the Zagros Mountains in the east. Tratal Huyuk, a rich archaeological site, might have supported up to 10,000 people. Although it lacked social hierarchy, it had a thriving industry in pottery and obsidian tools, and they have traded for seashells and flints from Syria. So this is the blue area here they're talking about. It's a wide space, isn't it? Away from like the Persian Gulf up into southern Anatolia. Number four, sorry, I'm chewing on this cough drop. 
Growth of Urban Life 6000 to 3000 BCE. The Ubayid people were the first to colonize southeastern Mesopotamia as the Stone Age gave way to the Copper Age. They used copper to make tools, were led by hereditary chieftains, and may even have had a primitive democracy. Ubayid settlements merged to form bigger communities, notably Uruk, which would become one of the first true cities and a hub of major trade networks. So here we have classic Mesopotamia, right? When things really start kicking off society-wise. Let's read all the little boxes and then I'm about to go lay down and not talk for hours. <laughs> Let's see right here. From... Oh, I can't fit it all in, I don't think. My bad. I can go like this. There we go. From 5400 BCE, it develops into one of the biggest settlements of the Ubaid culture, possibly the world's first city. Oh, that's Uruk. Gotcha. All right, oh no, that's Uruk. That's every two. Okay. We're going backwards again in history. <laughs> 5200 to 3500 BCE, settlement that gives its name to the Ubaid culture, develops use of copper based technology. There's Tell El Upayit. Up here, 2900 BCE, that's Uruk. The city becomes the largest in the world at the time. And this is Nippur. In 5000 BCE, it was an important religious center. <clears throat> Move over here to Tell Sawan. In 5000 BCE, is a settlement that used stone and flint tools and irrigation from the Tigris. For here in 6000 BC, it was a town occupied by Samara culture, known for finely made pottery. Let's move over here. Let's go a little earlier. 6000 BC is the village with agriculture. That's Tepe Sops. 7500 BC, settlement with domestication of animals such as goats. Right here in 6400 to 6200 BC is a small village based on dry farming, herding, and hunting. Up here in 6000 to 1500 BC was a settlement that produced monochromatic pottery. Very fancy. What else do we have? Up here in 6000 BC was the first known use of canal irrigation. Also in 6000 BCE, this was a trade hub, which also improves its own agriculture through irrigation. This site in 6000 BCE appears as specialized artisan village producing fine pottery. Over here in Germ, what does it say? Jarmo. Jarmo. Seven, 70, 90 <laughs> to 4950 BCE. Settlement engages in organized trade with obsidian and shells with distant places. Wow. In this town, from 5000 to 1500 BCE, this town includes one of the earliest known temples featuring pilasters and recesses. Pretty cool. <laughs> right here, 6100 to 5400 that gives its name to the Halaf culture, known for pottery with geometric or animal designs. That's awesome. Right here, 6500 and 2600 BCE, it becomes the gateway to the Tigris Valley and develops into one of the first cities. This side, 5500 to 4000 BCE, became the western outpost of Ubayid culture. Here's Gobekli Tepe, one of the very famous sites. From 9130 to 7370 BCE, the oldest known temple built by people who probably it's right on the line, carded plant resources, but had not started farming. <laughs> line right through these words. This site. Okay. 
So this site from 11,500 BCE was founded by the people of the Natufian culture. And then from 9,500 BCE, the settlements reoccupied after a period of abandonment and thrives as a village that uh, domesticates grains and sheep. Let's head to this end of the crescent. From 10,200 BCE, small village of Natufian hunters. The Tufian culture hunter gatherers. Down here in the Levant, that's Angazal, that's where these guys come from. 10,300 to 9550 BCE. Settlement consisting of farms supporting thousands of people produces lime plaster statues representing the human form. I didn't read the little caption here, but I'm not going to push it up. It says bigger settlements nurtured more complex belief systems. Lime plaster human figures buried beneath floors are possible evidence of ancestor worship. And these guys again, they're like this big. <laughs> From 10,000 BCE, right here, Jericho. Camping ground for Natufian hunter-gatherers grows into one of the world's oldest cities. Definitely one of the most oldest places still inhabited. Here's Beda, 7200 to 6500 BCE. People cultivate cereal grains and herd goats while hunting animals and gathering nuts. And here's good old Biblos. From 6000 BCE, one of the oldest continuously inhabited towns in the world. Along with Jericho, but yeah, that's another oldie right there. This is Ugarit. 6,000 BCE was a small fortified town with a surrounding wall. Up here in Cyprus in 9,000 BCE, there was a town with two-story round stone houses in Kyrokitia. Kyrokitia. Not sure. But up here in Anatolia, remember this is during what, 7,000 to 4,000 BCE. So in 6,000 BCE, after a period of abandonment, the village is reoccupied by a culture with advanced pottery. In this place, in 4,900 BCE, you've got sophisticated use of copper, including mace heads and jewelry. And here's classic Chital Huik. 7,400 to 5,200 BCE, early proto-urban settlement, develops new burial traditions beneath houses. And that's where we're going to end it today before I lose my voice. So next time we're going to look at maps from the ancient world. So that is it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you thought of this video if you're excited like I am to do more of this book. I do hope you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, 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 